Back at the workbench tonight to go over part two of Chevy Pi. Chevy Pi is the video entertainment system built on a Raspberry Pi 4 for my Chevy Traverse. In part one of this video series, we went over the hardware and software that would go into Chevy Pi. If you'd like to find out more information about the hardware and software and view part one, go ahead and click on this link that'll show up above. In part two of Chevy Pi, we'll start assembling the hardware, install the operating system onto the Raspberry Pi, and set up both Wi-Fi adapters so that the Chevy Pi can both broadcast a Wi-Fi signal and use a secondary Wi-Fi signal to give access to the outside world. First up, we have the Raspberry Pi and installing the three heat sinks that came with it from the can kit package that we got. We have three heat, heat sinks, one for the USB controller, one for the memory, and one for the processor. This one goes on the USB controller. This next one goes on the memory. And this last one goes on the processor. The heat sinks should help to dissipate some of the heat coming off the Raspberry Pi, but I plan to add some active cooling in the form of a fan to blow cooler air across the Raspberry Pi so that the system stays at a reasonable temperature while in use. Next up is the official Raspberry Pi case, which we will use initially but I plan to replace with a custom enclosure that's been 3D printed. Now that we have in the case, we can plug in the secondary Wi-Fi adapter into the USB and also the dongle for the controller that we're going to use initially for operating the system. Next up is getting the operating system installed on the SD card, so we're going to go ahead and head up to the computer and get that going. The Raspberry Pi 4 uses a version of Raspbian called Buster that can be downloaded from the website for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Once it is downloaded, it needs to be written to the SD card. There are various ways to do this, but I have found the easiest way on the Mac is to use a program called Etcher. Using Etcher, we can simply select our image file for Buster and Etcher will handle writing the image to the SD card. I'm going to configure the Pi for a headless setup, meaning I can connect to it remotely to do the configuration and won't need a keyboard or monitor connected to initially set it up. First I'll use the touch command via a terminal window to create an empty SSH file. This will tell the Pi to enable SSH when it first boots so that I can connect remotely. Next, I will again use the touch command to create a WPA supplicant file. I can then edit this file to provide the information the Pi needs to connect to my home Wi-Fi network, including the proper credentials. I can then save this file and eject the SD card so that I can install it into the Raspberry Pi. Now that the Raspberry Pi is all assembled and booted up and the operating system is running, we can go ahead and head back to the computer and connect into the Raspberry Pi for the first time, do some initial configuration, and get those Wi-Fi adapters configured. Back in the terminal window, I can now connect to the Raspberry Pi via SSH using the default user of Pi and the default network name of raspberrypi.local. Once I am in, I can begin changing some of the default configuration using the raspi config this includes changing the default password, changing the network name to Chevy Pi, and expanding the file system to use the full SD card. Once that is complete, I can select Restart the Pi so the changes can take effect. Then I can reconnect using the new network name of Chevy Pi. The next step is to modify the WPA supplicant config file to handle our dual Wi-Fi setup. First, I will make a backup of the original file using the cp command. Then I will rename the original file and append wlan0 to the file name. This will tell the Pi to use it for the first Wi-Fi adapter. I will then make a second copy of this file, but append wlan1 
to the name. This will tell the Pi to use it for the second Wi-Fi adapter. In this file, I will delete the network credentials because I don't want the adapter connecting to my home network since it will be the one broadcasting a signal. After a reboot, I can log back in and run the IF config command to verify the Wi-Fi adapters. As you can see, WLAN0 has connected to my home network and has an IP address. WLAN1 is connected to nothing and I will now proceed to configure it as an access point. Next, we need to run apt-get update and apt-get upgrade to handle updating all the packages on the system to their latest versions. I then can again use apt-get to install DNS Masquerade and host APD on the Pi. DNS Masquerade will be used to manage DHCP on the access point and host APD is the software that will actually handle the access point. Next up is to assign a static IP to WLAN1 which will be handling the access point. Using nano I can edit the DHCP CD config file and assign 192.168.10.1 to WLAN1. Now it is time to configure DNS Masquerade to handle assigning IPs to any client that connects to the Chevy Pi Wi-Fi signal. Using nano, I can edit the DNS MASQ config file telling DNS Masquerade to use WLAN1 and assign IPs from 192.168.10.2 to 10.50. I will also tell it to provide Google's DNS server at 8.8.8.8 .8 and what IPs it should listen on. Finally, I can configure the actual access point that will broadcast the Chevy Pi signal using host APD. I can use nano again to create a host APD config file and add the necessary lines to configure the access point, including setting the broadcast name to Chevy Pi and setting the password needed to access Chevy Pi to the phrase, I like to make stuff. Next, I need to tell host APD to use the file by putting a path to it in the host APD defaults file. Now I can use systemctl to first unmask the host APD service to allow it to run and then run systemctl enable to enable host APD at boot. Now there is just a couple more things to complete. First I must modify sysctl config to enable packet forwarding of traffic so that clients connected to Chevy Pi can also reach the internet if WLAN0 is connected to something. Next, after a reboot, I need to modify the IP table rules to route traffic that needs to get to the internet through WLAN0. I then need to store these IP table rule modifications in a file and modify rc.local to restore these rules at boot. With one final reboot of the Chevy Pi, I can log back in and run ifconfig to verify both network adapters are properly configured and looking on my Mac, I can see the Chevy Pi Wi-Fi is now broadcasting. Finally, I want to test the network speed of the Wi-Fi bridge from my iPad. I'll go ahead and connect to the new Chevy Pi Wi-Fi network that is being broadcasted and enter the password that I set up earlier. Then I can run the speed test app that I have installed on the iPad. As you can see, I'm getting 3.79 megabits down and almost 5 megabits per second up. These speeds aren't ideal, and I think I will investigate it in the future, but for now it will work. If you found the Chevy Pi project interesting, you can go ahead and subscribe to the channel and you'll get updates when I post videos about this project or any of my other projects in the future. If you'd like to get more information on the hardware that I'm using for Chevy Pi, you can go ahead and check out the links in the description below. That's a wrap for part two of the Chevy Pi project, and I'll see you with the next video.